he types up the, the Unix command to restart the web server processes, which would happen in just a few seconds. He types all that up, but he doesn't press enter. Then he takes the dog, and we're all crying around. He holds the dog like, in front of him, and he takes the little paw and like, click, yeah. pushes, the, pushes the enter key. So Rufus launched the site. This episode is sponsored by Florio, founded by ex-Amazonian Vijay Ravindran. Florio is the leading research-backed system using virtual reality to deliver immersive, fun, and affordable lessons for children and adults with autism spectrum disorder. Special discounts are available for current Amazon.com employees. Learn more at floriotech.com. That's F-L-O-R-E-O-T-E-C-H.com. Hi. I'm Dave Chappelle, and I'd like to welcome you to the Invent Like an Owner podcast, where I talk with the Amazonians who help build Amazon.com into one of the world's most valuable companies. This weekly podcast is for entrepreneurs, business leaders, and all students of history. The goal of the podcast is to capture the Amazon creation stories and create a historical archive. On that note, my guests are recalling history as best they can. It's possible some of the details are fuzzy or just plain wrong. If that happens, it isn't intentional. I invite future guests or commenters on the website to help us get the facts as straight as they can be. Now, on with the show. Today, I'm excited to be talking with Alex Edelman, who I remember is one of the nicest people at Amazon. As you'll learn, Alex learned, uh, joined Amazon fresh out of college and was one of, if not the first, full-time front-end web developers at the company. In fact, his first job title was HTML wizard. Uh, Alex is going to share what it was like being a 21-year-old uh, telling older and more experienced coworkers what could and couldn't be done in HTML, given HTML's limitations in 1997. And he'll also pass on advice to entrepreneurs who are working in new technologies uh, where the tools are still very primitive. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Dave. You're far too kind. I'm so happy to be on, I'm so happy to be on the show and to have a chance to share some of my stories with everybody. Awesome. So let's start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start. Uh, how did you get to Amazon? You know, what year? And you know, may maybe give some of that background. Right. So uh, I was an English major at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in uh, the late '90s, and the internet was spreading very quickly at universities at that time. And actually, uh, even though I wasn't an engineering major, my English department was very tech forward. Uh, they had their own Unix server, which was on the public internet. Uh, and so I had an account on that server, which gave me a sandbox to learn web programming. And by the time I was a senior at UPenn, I had steady side work uh, building websites for various university departments. So I cut my teeth building building out the University of Pennsylvania's web presences across across a few different departments. Now, and, uh, so go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and I'm assuming that uh, Amazon wasn't actively recruiting on campus at, in, at that early. Maybe they were, but I, I didn't think they were. So how did you find out about the opportunity at Amazon in particular? And, and then also, like, what attracted you to Amazon back then? Yeah, uh, they definitely weren't doing on-campus recruiting, nothing organized like that. Uh, I got my Amazon introduction via one of the professors who I worked for, uh, James O'Donnell, was uh, uh, is a classics professor, and uh, he was also uh, the vice provost for information systems at University of Pennsylvania at the time. And so I worked for him doing different different projects. And he had previously taught at University of Washington uh, in a previous year, where he met Rebecca Staffel, who was an early Amazon employee, who uh, at the time was studying for her library science degree. Uh, and so after the fact, in the, in, in, uh, the spring of 90, 1997, and Rebecca, tell me who, who was Rebecca again, just to give context for listeners, uh, Rebecca Staffel was on, uh, Miriam Mohit's, uh, site development editorial team and, uh, was, was there earlier than me, but I can't remember exactly how much longer she had been there, but prior Got to it. me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in the spring of 1997, uh, Rebecca calls up. Uh, Professor O'Donnell and says something to the effect of, hey, uh, I'm looking for a book lover who is familiar with Unix and knows how to make web pages. Right. And James said, I have the man for you. Uh, so that's that's called being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Uh, and that was how I got my uh, my phone screen, which which led to my interview. And now, so what prior was it? 
Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, pr prior to the interview, I was already an Amazon customer. So I was aware of them, but I wasn't thinking of them as a job opportunity per se. I had bought programming books uh, and also a bunch of obscure out of print titles. So I was pretty familiar with sort of uh, the long tail of Amazon beyond just the bestseller lists. Right. Uh, and throughout the interviews, I was, I was definitely compelled by the idea of of bringing literacy and broad access to all kinds of books, to all kinds of people. You know, to me, the idea of the long tail is, uh, is very egalitarian. Uh, it's not just the bestseller list that someone has, you know, maybe paid to be on or that, you know, a, a small number of bookstores have elected to carry. Yeah. And so I like the idea that a customer could find something really great. It was very idealistic. I also liked that Amazon was taking the internet seriously. You know, the idea of a catalog that had millions of titles was, was pretty bold and audacious in the late 90s. But, you know, I'm, I'm in the interview, uh, th this whole interview day, and I'm sort of silently incredulous the whole time because we're talking about all this stuff. And I'm thinking, they really want to pay me to make <laughs> websites? Because, I don't know, I mean, I, to me, I knew the internet was growing academically, but in a business sense, I didn't really have any idea. Um, and frankly, my other job prospects were looking kind of ho-hum for me. You know, I wasn't right. really a business type, but I figured, well, I could probably monetize my hobby for a few years after college while I figured out what I really wanted to do. Right. Uh, and also, um, my Amazon offer included, among other things, a relocation bonus. So, you know, I'm 21, I think, hey, free cross-country move. Right. <laughs> that, was, um, that was my mindset at the time that I uh, was interviewing at Amazon. Well, you, you just said you liked that Amazon was taking the web seriously. Can you just, like, tell me what you mean by that or uh, tell listeners what you mean by that? Like, did you have a different sense of what the web could be, you know, versus maybe what mainstream did? Or was it just your, your initial reaction to the team? My resume had, at the time, a list of uh, URLs that were the portfolio of the work I had done while in college, you know, mostly, mostly university URLs. So I understood that the web was, was growing. It was very valuable for at least an academic setting and for access and tooling. But I didn't have the sense that it was important for business. So there were really no other businesses that had online presences, and it wasn't viewed as necessary to have any kind of online support for whatever your business did or a, you know, a municipal service or something like that. So the idea that this was a full-time company where they only had an internet presence, uh, you know, I thought was, was pretty out there. And I was amazed that they even had enough work for me full-time. <laughs> well, I know, I know you also then said you were a technical hire, but you weren't on the engineering team. How does that, just for someone who doesn't really know how to think about that, you know, a listener, what, what, what was the dis distinction or, you know, why would it matter? Um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so Kim and Joel, some of your previous guests have talked a lot about the engineering teams. Dwayne and Ruben were on the engineering team. I think Dwayne was Ruben's manager, right? So there was a group of people who were actually building the website and the software every day and, you know, scrambling around trying to keep everything up and running. Um, I was hired onto Miriam Mohit's site development and editorial team, which was not under the engineering organization. So uh, I forget if I picked that job title or she picked it, HTML wizard, but you know, we kind of thought it was cute. And uh, uh, the site obviously existed prior to my arrival, but I was the first specialist in UI. And it was viewed as something that belonged with the homepage and the staff who wrote reviews uh, and not viewed as essential backend engineering. Right. And so when you were hired, I know you were in the low hundred employee count. Uh, what were you, what were your, what were you first tasked to do? And maybe it was just get used to things, but like, what was after that first two, two answers, what, what were your first tasked to do? And then what was like the first big thing you worked on, you know, to sort of really get not, not your feet wet, but your whole body immersed in, uh, in how things got done. <laughs> Underwater as it Underwater, were, gasp, gasping drowning. for breath. Yeah, yeah that's about right. Yeah. That's right. Well, so yeah, it was about 400 staff or so when I first started. And that, and that time we just counted the, uh, the, the warehouse employees and CS and everyone as staff. So that would be the whole Columbia building on 2nd Avenue plus the, the Soto warehouse on 4th and Dawson. That was the company when I started. Um, 
on my very first day, uh, the other uh, technical folks on Miriam's team uh, walked me over to the crumpet shop in Pike's Market, and uh, we had crumpets. And they told me about you know how things worked, how to organize things. Right. Uh, the co- obviously, the company just sold books back then. You know, it was right there on the website, Amazon.com books. Right. Um, and uh, it, it was very easy to pinpoint at that time where Jeff was in the building if he was in the building because of that iconic laugh. Yeah. Uh, so my first few projects were just fixing bugs on the site while I learned how to work on an engineering team. I had never worked with other engineers before in a shared code base. So I had a lot of ramping up to do in, in those best practices, and I was tutored in programming pretty much from the get-go. But it wasn't long before I was pulled into my first big project, which was the V3 launch. All right, so, so V3, when did that happen and what was the... I, a, few, a few people have mentioned it. This will probably be the first time we go into detail about it. But like, so was it, I'm assuming it was late in 97, um, but what were, what were a couple of the big things that were part of it? Yeah, so V3 was a site redesign, at least from my perspective it was. I had my hands full doing that. We were introducing a new nav bar site-wide and several new features, um, which I can talk a little bit about. But I think we were going to launch in September, October of 97. Um, I know it was going to be before the holidays, but also just as soon as possible. Um, And uh, so, you know, what was going on then is that our our product catalog was growing in size and we were growing in customers. Um, But the way that almost all customers interacted with our site was they would come to the homepage, they would do a search, they would hopefully add that book to their shopping cart, your detail page, shopping cart, buy, and then they would be gone. So, and as the catalog grows, we wanted to make sure that, we, we wanted to find ways to expose the customers to uh, the, the breadth and depth of our catalog. So we built new UI features to try to expose those parts of the catalog, uh, namely browse, uh, right. browsing through lists of titles by category, by taxonomic classification was a huge feature that we built. I believe we built it for V3. I'm almost so, sure. So before V3, because everybody's mentioned browse and maybe just clarify for me the difference between browse and nav, just because they, they there are some similarities, but did they not have categories of products before v3 or how how were the how were the books organized or how did a customer if they weren't going to search did they just find the ones that were on the home page or you know was there no browse hierarchy or, or taxonomy uh i mean i have these mock-ups that i worked on with the designers in the summer where i was building browse templates right. so i know i don't think browse browse existed before i came uh and yeah you could search there were some lists there were bestseller lists and there were featured titles so we had editors who were writing features about great new books that were coming out across different categories but with with browse then we would have actual places for different genres science fiction right. over here romance over there in fact we called them book rooms for a while I was looking at my notes we, we called them book rooms for a while we didn't really know what to call these browse landing pages where we would introduce the the genre or what was what was interesting in that category um, and so it was also interesting because it was it was like this combination of our like book loving nerdery meeting computer science graph theory right. because there's really thousands of ways you can organize titles and you could program it in a pretty dumb way but we need to program it in a smart way so that we it would go out on the site and scale and at the time we weren't allowed to use relational databases for any of our content that we that we wrote. So we had to find ways of building these read-only data caches and kind of crude files that we would push out in a bundle along with the software in order to to make these features actually work on the website. Can you just take a, a little d- detour there for a second and tell me why why relational databases weren't an option at, at that point? Well, I think uh, Kim described it really well. We had two big servers. We had the web server and we had the database server, two hardware, two pieces of hardware. Uh, there wasn't yet a services, services, uh, service-based organization. So um, uh, the database was, was pr- plenty busy fulfilling orders, uh, taking orders, and storing critical customer information like credit cards. Right. Uh, and uh, it, there weren't enough, it wasn't enough bandwidth between the web server and the database server to pull any kind of read-only content like that. Um, and we didn't have enough memory on the web server to cache it. So we right. had to build files. Uh, and uh, it, it was part of this homegrown system that we've been de- we developed over the years. 
You mentioned one other big part, the navigation. So can you talk about, uh, maybe just quickly describe, was, there was no navigation before because you just said it was just Amazon Books. So what, what was the big deal about adding navigation uh, to the website? Well, I was even speaking about something more simple, like a nav bar on every page. The site was so crude back then, it, it wasn't even, didn't even have a consistent look and feel or nav bar across the top. And so we added features that would allow the uh, customers to try new things. So we had browse for categories. We had bestseller lists. We had, what else do we have? Award-winning books. Oh, yeah. And the very first version of our recommendations system uh, we went through a lot of iterations on that, uh, but we—I know we launched something in with V3 that would recommend books to the customers. And prior to that, the site didn't really know anything about the customer. Right. You would just browse the site, and it was just the same thing. So you would have a shopping cart, uh, but other than that, there was no no personalization of the site. Like not yeah. certainly not compared to today. Yeah, Mariam, who headed your organization, she's a VP of site development. Uh, she mentioned that. Um, V and I haven't spoken to her yet uh, publicly, you know, but we've been talking behind the scenes. And she mentioned that instant recommendations were a big feature that the SVP David Risher wanted because it was something he could talk about to the press, you know, that was easy to communicate. Like the we we can make recommendations, you know, based on your particular interests. Could do you remember how was that fuel? Was it fueled by? Did you have to indicate a bunch of books that you liked? Because if you were a brand new customer who hadn't purchased anything and hadn't really looked at much, how do you remember how that was powered? I remember I have mock-ups where I built a UI around something that was just like that, where the customer would basically fill out a quiz yeah. and we would figure out, you know, what, what kind of books we might, we might be worth recommending to them. And that was the input to the recommendations engine. I don't remember if we actually launched with that one or something that was better and uh you know, more passive based on the customer's behavior. Um, it's, it's we're talking twenty five years ago here, so I don't really remember the details. That's fine. I, uh, it, by the way, for the listener, I'd love to get any screenshot copies you have, and we can add it to the post, like we did for Dwayne. Uh, Ruben had a ton of uh, photos for his his episode, so it was fun to add all that. And so, yeah. So tell me, so I mean, you were twenty one years old. You were new at the company. I, I, how was it? Like, tell me about what made the V3 difficult, maybe, you know, because I'm assuming people wanted it to look a certain way and act a certain way. You know, tell me how that was and, um, you know, what your reactions were to everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely where, you know, that metaphor of being slightly underwater, you know, uh, <laughs> rings true for me. You know, because I, I, I had been building with what, everything that HTML and the web could do for a few years, but when I worked on V3 with the design team, you know, these were, these were designers who had 20 plus years of experience uh, using, and, and they would deliver uh, mock-ups that were, you know, basically Photoshop style, static print style layouts with uh, all the positions of all the elements fixed. And they were very rich with graphics and text interspersed. Well, they, and, they were, it, they were used to designing for print publications, right? And for, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe this was, there was no such thing as a web designer back then. Uh, so we had hired other kinds of designers to do the work of designing for the web. And so here I and my job, since I was a technical hire, uh, my job was really sitting at the, at the edges of the intersections between all these different disciplines, editorial, design, marketing, and to a certain extent, the engineering, the capabilities of, of the platform. So, um, so here I am, 21, looking at these designs and thinking, wow, this is great. This is great. This looks awesome. I can't implement any of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then began, you know, a long series of back and forth where I would build what I could implement as a, 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 onto the, on our development server. And then the designer, we would have design reviews where they would look at what actually existed and they would mark it up and try to reclaim, you know, better, better control over the design and positioning. So I, I, I spent a lot of time in those early years, unfortunately, apologizing for what HTML couldn't do. Um, and and trying to negotiate what we what we could do with uh, the tools that we had, with the capability, with the layout that we had, uh, right. um, yeah, in the browser. And so, uh, and and how about like, I'm assuming everything was short staffed, right? Like the you know just that's been the consistent theme of not only the first all these conversations, but also my years there. So how did that manifest itself if if you needed? 
something done by a technical team or somebody in editorial, like you're on Miriam's team. That's a whole bunch of non-technical people actually. And so how did that work with a big launch, like a site redesign where you need some technical things done? Like what, were there any hacks you guys put together to, to make yourselves more effective or more productive? Yeah, I mean the the uh, the engineers basically built a, a, a basic templating system for for me to use, which would allow me to build uh, templates. And this is all in a pre PHP world. There was there weren't the kind of web frameworks that there are today, so that I could build templates and UIs that uh, I could launch without having to recompile the software. And also Got these it. data cache files were ways we could add new features, new lists of things to the site without it being search or placing an order or any of these any of the core functionality which which the uh, the engineers worked on. And so in that sense, they were trying to enable more and more staff, technical staff like me and the non-technical staff who I supported, to build more the site out with more stuff uh, right. without everything having to go through, you know, Kim's uh, uh, Kim's engineering team because we knew that didn't scale either. Right. And did did was it Kim's team or was it somebody in your org that built like the tools for the editors to use to like create reviews, you know, and, or to modify the content on the bestseller page, you know what I mean? Or all of the, the category nodes, you know, there's a history page, you want to have some history content and history bestsellers. So were those, were, were those things, were those tools that were built for the editors done by somebody on, on, in Mariam's org, or was that something done in conjunction with Kim and the, the technical engineering side of things? As you remember. By and large, by and large, they were done by Miriam's org, and you know this this almost uh, predicts a future where Amazon has self sufficient teams that can do as much as they as much as possible to launch a new product or a new feature without having to work through centralized resource planning. Um, so yeah, the other technical hires on Miriam's team and I built the tools for the editors to schedule and preview and launch content, um, and we kept on evolving those tools. You know, chipping away at them to make them a little bit sharper over the years to enable uh, more feature development. Uh, we were also hiring up more staff at that time, not just technical, but non-technical. And so everything was growing. And these right. people who had been around even just a few months earlier had the, had the, had the scarce knowledge that they'd had to try to, to, uh, to scale out and to train up more people and to build tools to automate the things that you used to do manually. So I'm going to jump around a little bit. Like, so tell me about launch night. So you probably worked on this, what, for months? Like, uh, what, what was it like? Did, when did we launch? Did we, was it during a slow part of the day? Was it at night? Like, or, you know, tell me how that worked back then. So I, I love launch night. That was the, the launch nights of the big projects were some of my fondest memories at the company. Uh, and because, you know, when you're working on a big project like this, especially a, for me, a site redesign or a whole bunch of new features, you're spending months living in the future. You know, right. when I looked at the Amazon website on my, uh, from my desktop, my personal copy, it had all these cool new features. It had a new nav bar look and feel. It was way better than what was live. Right. Uh, and uh, obviously there were many others who were also working toward this, this goal of push, pushing something out that's great for the customers. You know, it's a process of creation. Um, and so when you go to launch night, that's the night when you're going to actually roll it out. And it's really exciting. Obviously, people are both tired and a little bit nervous because they don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and what we do was we would launch in the middle of the night because the traffic was the lowest then. And since we really didn't know what was going to happen, we wanted to uh, have basically the least amount of risk as possible and with the ability to roll it back if it was completely messed up. Right. Uh, this was also a, uh, in the days where we didn't pre-announce things. There were very limited press releases for things. So it was just, we're rolling out new features. We're not going to give any notice. We don't want any competitors to know any, anything more. And so we would just, you know, we would just do it as it were. Uh, yeah, I talked and to, so I, I talked to somebody just as an aside on that, that told me like, even back then it was, we didn't even send launch emails. Like it was a big argument inside the company. Like engineers didn't want to send anything because considering it spam, whereas at some point, people like, you know, VP Jen Cast, you know, to launch the music store, like, no, we have to email customers and tell them we have a, a new music store, you know. And so, you know, it's possible we didn't even tell customers about the nav, you know, or the changes. It was just different the next day. We just wanted to have the option to where if it really didn't work, we weren't committed to a public date of, right. of launching a new product. Uh, certainly not back then where we were, you know, I, I don't even know how we determined what the date was. 
uh, maybe that there just weren't any more P1 bugs. <laughs> so when we um, pushed something like that out, did we put, I mean, was it so back in the day that we would put up like a, a we're, we're temporarily closed for maintenance or was it just, it would switch over, uh, you know, for customers as the, you know, the cached website got updated? We didn't have to take down the site for things. I remember V3, we did not. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe for others, we had to very, very briefly. But what, what would happen was, so we all we would all collect around someone's desk in the in the Columbia building. And like I said, it's late at night, and we've been working on this for months. People are people are gassed. They're so exhausted, but they're also excited because yeah. it's again, it's it. We're 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 finally going live with something they've been working really hard on. Uh, and anyone who's a student of Amazon history knows that. The uh, the reason why Amazon is such a a dog friendly culture is due to one dog, and that dog's name is Rufus. Rufus the dog. That's right. Eric and Susan Benson's lovely little corgi. Uh, he was a fixture all around the, the 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 Columbia building when I started, and I remember my first week he would just you know just just silently watch me eat my burrito and just give me the puppy dog eyes, literal puppy dog eyes. Yeah, as uh, uh, and beg for food, but sweet little dog. And so, uh, in the middle of the night, um, we would gather around probably Eric Benson's desk, and he would write up the command. So we'd already pushed the software out; the bundle is out on the web server, but it's not live. He he, he types up the, the Unix command to flip the symbolic link to the new bundle and restart the web server processes, which would happen in just a few seconds. He types all that up, but he doesn't press enter. Then he takes the dog. And we're all crying around. He holds the dog like, in front of him, and he takes the little paw and like, click. Yeah. Pushes the pushes the enter key. So Rufus launched the site. Yeah. Uh, he did he did this for V three and music and you know countless others. Yeah. Um, and you know what happens at first is nothing really because it's kind of anticlimactic. You just pushed a button. Right. But you know, shortly thereafter, we we start tailing the log files, following the logs of activity, and you see people are starting to pick it up and use it right away, right. Uh, which is like a real, real exciting, a really exciting thing. Uh, but then, of course, along with that traffic comes uh, bugs. So in the error logs, you also see, oh, that's a fatal error. Uh oh, that's another bug. I better go work at that. And so what would usually happen, including V three, is after the initial excitement wears off. You go back to your desk for a few more hours and fix those really important ones that can't wait till the morning, you know, get that patched out and then, you know, go home with the pager close by and try to get a few hours of sleep before the next day. Yeah, I remember for launches, you, you just can't go to sleep. You're sitting there for hours using it in real time. And, you know, at some point you just got to go collapse and, you know, go to sleep and you come back in the next day and you realize it's time to just start it all over again. Um, right. you know, start working it's, on what's next. And it's still, it, it's still day one the next morning. Yeah, exactly. So V3 was a big deal because it brought much better discovery tool. I mean, right, like discovery and a much richer experience. Like when you think about the leadership, the Amazon leadership principle, or at that time it was the core value, what was it all about? What, customer obsession? Like what, where do you see what was it all about back for that bit for V3? Because so many people gotta... talk about V3. Like I, it comes up all the time. It was before I got there. So it's interesting to hear all the old timers like you and Mariam and Joel and Kim, like everybody talks about it. So it must have been just a really, really big deal for the early the early teams that constantly still refer back to it. Yeah, it, it was a big deal, and I think I think you nailed it, Dave. It's it's really customer obsession, basically from the time I started in the summer of '97 all the way through this launch and beyond. It became very clear to me that this wasn't just a job, uh, that, you know, and these weren't just engineers building some stuff. Like we were all collectively on a mission to serve customers best, to help them find the right book or the right product for them, and uh, and. Um, it, it, it meant a lot to us that they actually started using the using it right away, and that we were continuing to grow. And so, when you think you you mentioned some things, but uh, we talked earlier before the call about um, what were some of the tools that got built. That you know, just to give an example for people, because engineers now, it, you have to put it into perspective of what things were like back in 1997. Like, were there you know one or two like key tools or or process changes that even changed during the launch that that stick out for you? I can think about one that really illustrates where the internet was when I started versus where it went went after there uh, and, and definitely uh, is relevant to things like scaling and growth. Uh, 
product images. So uh, when you go to uh, a detail page, you see uh, an image there. And right. since uh, when I came, we only sold books. They were called cover images, so the cover right. of the book. And when I started at the company, uh, if an editor wanted to uh, run a feature on a book, like say we were going to put a book on sale, a bestseller or something, they would write the feature and then they would use some internal tool to that would eventually run uh, a script. There was a there was a, a Mac desktop sitting under my desk that would run these scripts to grab a cover image and apply a little sticker on it, like a little discount right. sticker that says 40% off or on sale or whatever, some little image. Yep. It would apply the transformation to put the sticker on the, on the cover image and then upload the new cover image uh, uh, onto the to a, a spot where the production web server could access it. And by the way, Kim is not going to be happy that I'm telling this story, but this little file system for, for the cover images, it bypassed all of our rigorous software and catalog deployment mechanisms. Toaster 4 was mounted directly online. So... Uh, we use that to our advantage. <laughs> she'll be uh, she'll be commenting on this. Kim, yeah. Kim commented earlier today, so that's that's awesome. <laughs> sorry, Kim. I'm so sorry, but it was really cool. Uh, and uh, so you know, uh, in terms of our growth, like this is great when you want to write a, a a feature or two, and you're you know you're working with a small team. But over time, you know, our our uh, our, our marketing department and other departments want to be able to put stickers on anything, and they want to be able to change the prices dynamically on the site right. and have the customers see what's on on sale. And so we really couldn't do this with like a build. We needed to find a way to at at runtime figure out if we need to apply any special transformations to to the cover image um, and, and then uh, and then serve an image like that and then cache it so that the next time you don't have to do the computation. So right. uh, we it's what started as a, a small script running on a Mac eventually became uh, an image server which at times would could do more traffic than the web server itself because if you think about the request pattern for e-commerce pages uh, okay you've got one detail page and one cover image but on the home page you might have six or seven cover images right. or search or browse or really any list of products you've got maybe a dozen image Im image server calls for one web server call so yeah. this other piece of software had to had to be scalable and performant and do all the kinds of crazy stickers and translations and rotations and scaling that the site development and marketing teams needed in order to grow the site in the late 90s. Yeah, yeah and even every stick every book cover itself just using that example, you could have multiple sizes because you could have a tiny one on a search result, a big one on the page. You, you to your point, you could have one that's tilted 35 degrees, you know, to make it look better in a fan style or whatever. So, so that all got built or the first version of that all got built during V3. That's what you're saying. That's great. Uh, no, it, it, I would say it was after V3, but okay. it, around this time is, is, uh, um, we knew that this little Mac applying the sticker scripts was not going to scale. And we started working on more sophisticated solutions. By the time the image server was, came to full fruition, uh, it had the attention of of uh, people like Kim and Joel, and we had right. you know a larger engineering team working on it because it was so critical to not only the customer experience but to the availability of the site. Right, and so and you also told me a story earlier about the well, you mentioned the pager earlier, so I wanted to make sure we came back to the pager story before we uh, before we got to the music or the big music launch. Uh, why don't you tell the story about the pager? But it's actually. It's not just a good story about you and your wife, but it's uh, just a good story also about ownership and the type of um, what engineers, a lot of people, but primarily engineers had to deal with for a long time. Yeah, so the pager, uh, that was one of those things that definitely I needed to scale at some point in my life. Um, you know, I was given my first pager sometime when I was 21 or 22, and that was uh, someone else on the team who used to carry the pager. They were a fungible engineer, and so they were moved to another another department, and they were like, hey, you know how to how to do all this web stuff. So different people who carried pagers own different kind of areas of the, of the, of the system, but I would own, I would be the first point of contact for customer-facing UI issues, um, which included typos or just HTML errors or really, you know, sometimes catalog errors. Um, and uh, I was really the only one who was on call for that for a long time. And then in the sometime in 98, um, 
uh, a bunch of us, it was, it was a weekend, uh, a bunch of us uh, on the web team all decided to go out kayaking. And so, you know, it was one of those rare times we got to go do something fun and we weren't working. And so we, we go out, we go out kayaking and I'll never forget, we're on, we're on the lake and I look off to my side and I see one of my colleagues coming straight at me broadside uh, and with this look of deep fear on her face. And the last thing she said to me before the boat hit me was, no brakes. <laughs> <laughs> so she, you know, uh, the, the bow of the boat literally hits me in the side. I tumble off into the water. My pager unclips from my belt and goes sinking to the bottom of Lake Union. And, and we looked around. And we were like, oh, no. The whole web team is here on the water. The pager's gone. We're right. just totally unreachable. If right. something were to go, where something were to go wrong, and uh, that Monday morning, the web team got together and we were, we agreed, okay, we need to have an on-call rotation, and yeah. it can't it can't just be Alex anymore. It needs to be we need to share the load. Um, and uh, what's amazing though is that the story is really about ownership. Uh, it's one of those other Amazon principles that comes up often, and everyone was so committed to building the website, it actually wasn't that hard to staff up an on-call rotation with a primary and a secondary, and right. you know it, it would change over the weeks. And of course, with each person we hired, we could add them to the rotation, and then the, the work comparatively for the others would reduce. So you know, back then, it, it wasn't just being on call. It was about what kind of tooling and other best practices could you capture you know, at 3 in the morning when you fixed a problem wow. so that the next person on call would have an easier job of it. To be a devil's advocate, why was it that important to fix a typo at three in the morning? You know what I mean? If, if you look back on that, you say maybe some of those could have been put in a list and you, you get to it at nine. You know what I mean? Like, I understand doing everything you can too, but like, was there at that point in time, the concept of V1, V, or I'm sorry, like priority one, priority two, priority three? Because it, it seemed like back then you were doing a lot of things that could have waited six hours. Well, you might have to ask David or Miriam about that. All but, right. uh, you enough. know, it's actually, it, it, uh, although I, I have to say, again, a 22-year-old English major does not want to look dumb with typos on a website that, you know, upwards yeah. of, you know, maybe a million people are using. So I, I didn't want the typo on there either. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I didn't always have a problem. I, I wasn't always uh, upset by the idea of being paged to fix something. I, I wanted to know. I know I owned a lot of that code and I wanted to know if I had caused the error. And oftentimes I had caused the error. So it's probably good that I should fix it. Right. So let's jump ahead. So the next big thing you worked on, um, which we've talked about with some other people, um, uh, is the moving from books only to we're going to sell other products. You know, music launched, I think, in June of 98. And then video and or DVD video uh, launched later that year, I think in November before the holidays. Well, what was your role on that launch? And and why was that not, not only a big deal, but why was it really difficult? Like, because someone who's not thinking that deeply about it could say, well, you're just now at books. Now you just do CDs, which is, you know, more more products. Why was that why was it a big deal and why was it really, really difficult? Yeah, music was a big one. Um, you know, it was our first expansion beyond books. And so, you know, from just from the get go, you know, we've got you've got, say, you know, two dozen or more engineers or technical types who've been assuming that the, th the product going through your software is books for the last for, for two plus years. So there were just many built up assumptions. And the UI code base uh, also it said Amazon.com books uh, as the as the as as the title of the company everywhere, and so I had to touch just about every line of display code to break that assumption that the product type was books. Mm -hmm. um, so the work was across the stack. The, the the software had to change. The catalog obviously had to change. Uh, fulfillment systems had to change. You know, we were again we weren't just selling books anymore. We were sourcing all kinds of different products. Uh, that were there was media, but it was it was uh, the uh, music cover images are a different shape and size than book cover images. The availability was different. Uh, there were different catalog fields like say runtime instead of page count. Um, yeah. You know, you, you don't that doesn't really look very professional if you say the page count is twenty minutes. You yeah. know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so it was just a lot of code that had to change, uh, and a lot of UI assumptions had to be changed for me especially. 
Um, and I remember, you know, I was working on my list of bugs for the music launch, and I saw this bug go by in the database that uh, that in the fulfillment system in the, in the warehouses, uh, the shrink wrapper was melting the CDs. Right. Uh, I just thought, geez, you know, I've got I've got bugs and I've got problems, but at least my bugs don't actually don't like melt customer orders. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> that so seemed like a, a, that seemed like a tough problem. From a web dev perspective, I mean, you must have literally been finding things in the templates where they said, "What's the book title?" rather than product title or book category, you know, rather than product category, things like that. That probably every template, someone who was right who wrote it two years prior didn't think about other things. So it was probably all of the, the, the descriptions were book specific. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Every template. And also this, you know, I've been talking a little bit about some of these templating capabilities that uh, we were given but from the other engineering staff. Um, this was really the time when we decided that we needed, uh, we needed to be able to, to say, if something else, something else. Uh, in the code, in, in, in the template at runtime, so we could switch on the product type at runtime. Um, and that was a big change. That was when our, our custom templating language started, started feeling like, instead of just some macros, it started feeling a little bit like a programming language, which was utilized by an increasingly large group of, of web and UI developers. What, um, was that, what was that called? And what was an example of, what's an example of that? What was it called? And like, what was an example of that? So the, 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 the software that, that, uh, received the request, processed the request was called Obidos. And uh, others, Kim have, have talked about yeah. that. Ruben's work was in Obidos, for example. Uh, but then when it came to interpret the HTML templates, they had a macro system, which they called CatSubst. Uh, and I think it was short for like uh, catalog category. substitution or category substitution, something like that. It was a, it was a kind of a, yeah, I okay. forget exactly. I probably should know the answer since I'm an expert in it, but I don't. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, cat subs had very humble beginnings where in the, you know, when I first came, it would, it, there would be a little macro on a template that would allow me to append the session ID onto every link on the template so that between one page to the next, the, uh, we could remember where the, what the customer's shopping cart was because right. we didn't even assume that the customer had cookies in the late nineties. So yeah. with the session ID and the URL, you could map to, you could map to a shopping cart that we store without a cookie. Right, um, and then from and, and then we get to music where we need to do if it's this kind of product or if it's or later on with uh, toys and video if it's you know if the age range of the of the child is this then we have to do different kinds of UI and Got so um, over time we beg borrowed and stealed uh, new cat subs macros out of the developers in order to enable again loose coupling between the layers more expansion of, of UI features with a team that owns as much of that as possible without having to go through centralized centralized planning. Would, would, would cat subs be used for something as, as well like, well, actually back in 97, people weren't browsing uh, on phones, right? But they, would it be based on the size or the resolution of their screen or would, like were there, were there blind web browsers at the time? Like, I don't know, is that the type of thing it would be used for as well? That's a good question. Um, uh, you actually mentioned something that we did do with CatSubs, uh, where in the, I forget when it was, somewhere, somewhere in the late 90s, um, after music, uh, I was, there was already this like chirp of, of something new going on, a new platform where uh, some people would come to, my, come to my office and say, hey, uh, have you heard about this this browser that runs on cell phones in Japan and the Japanese uh, telco providers are giving internet over the, uh, over the cell towers. Um, and I was like, man, that sounds really primitive. And you know, the screens were this big. So they were yeah. these tiny little postage stamp screens, low resolution, low bandwidth, you know, limited access. And you had um, to type using the one to nine or you the, the 12 keys on the phone. Yeah, that's right. No, no multi-touch. Um, but you know, this is another example. I said, yeah, let's let's build custom templates for mobile browsers and push it out there. We didn't have to change any of the backend software. We just had to reskin the features to do to to ha to accommodate the the limited uh, uh, capabilities of the cell phones. But that was really when we started doing uh, mobile web uh, support for customers as well. And it was probably another five, 10 years before mobile became really big, but 
Cat Subst allowed you to basically do a lightweight version that was good enough maybe at the at that point in time without requiring a major project because you could just say if they're coming on this type of a device give them the you know an extremely scaled down version of the data on the screen is that kind of the version of it like no image maybe <laughs> just the yes title, exactly the price yeah Right, That's exactly. Awesome. And, and you did mention the blind. Actually, in the late 90s, we also had a text only version of the website where we would switch out the graphics and try to simplify the layout so that uh, for those browsers that would read that would read the page to the to the end user, it, it would it would it, it would work. Right. Brutal triage was a term I learned when I got to Amazon. Can you just give another maybe 30 seconds on that? I mean, because the real summary is you're getting up to a couple of days before launch and you have 18 things that aren't going to make it, you know, so just maybe explain what that was, who would lead it and, you know, sort of what you learned from that. Well, a lot of the leaders like, like, uh, Miriam or the, or the PMs would, would, would drive that, that prioritization, but I would give my input like, well, to fix this bug, it would be, you know, a certain number of days or hours, a certain amount of risk. Is the customer experience really worth it, uh, to, to do that work now versus a week or so from now? Right, and uh, usually the answer is no. Uh, usually the answer is, you know, we want them to to be able to browse the site. We want them to be able to to find books and to add them to their shopping cart. And as long as that works well, then we're launching. Yeah, I I remember uh, Kim Rockmiller, who interviewed on the first episode. She gave me the example of when they were launching music, that they weren't going to make, they weren't going to have classical. I think was the classical catalog wasn't going to make launch, and she and Jen had a healthy discussion over that, you know, and basic, but that's an example of something that got triaged and probably brutal triage to say, no, we're not going to launch the world's greatest music store, what we wanted to do at the time with classical, because it's not make or break for the day of launch. And I think classical then launched probably two months later or something like that. But um, I don't know, the one, the other thing I learned with brutal triage is a lot of times like those things that you really think matter don't matter that much. Like, yes, yeah. you can launch them a week or a month later, but some of them never launch <laughs> because the, the the core things don't work or, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah. yeah. And we really never had the staff to, to to feel like we fully staffed anything back right. then. It was always like, well, what, what could we get away with, uh, with with the resources we have? And we don't want to do, launch something in like the middle of the holidays because we wanted to keep the site somewhat stable. Um, and certainly during the first couple of holidays, I spent my time in the warehouses instead of in front of a desk, yeah. just, you know, pa packing orders and, and pretending like I was a Christmas elf. Yeah. I enjoyed that time. Honestly, I, it, it was a nice change of pace and, and you also got to see how your work manifested in the products going to customers. So, so if yeah. you had to step back and give advice to, and I'd say from, I asked this of every guest, but if like your, your perspective is unique because you were sort of building the front end at the, at a time when the tools were pretty, you know, not, <laughs> not developed. So if you think about advice for current entrepreneurs, maybe in new areas of technology, what, what would you pass on from your experience at Amazon as a, a youngster with limited tools or limited yeah. tools on the web? You had plenty of tools. So <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, yeah, well, so I have been thinking a little bit about this with the benefit of hindsight. And I think, I feel like, you know, young technologies just don't have great tooling. Uh, and, you know, it, if I think about the internet back then, there were no internet scale, no SQL databases. There was no WordPress. There was no PHP. There were no edge caches. We had to build all that stuff ourselves because the, and, and it was like the, the tools were like made of stone. And so I feel like if an entrepreneur wants to maximize their impact in like a, a greenfield environment or a young technology, You've just got to be willing to work with the stone tools, yeah. And uh, I and, and you know what can you make with those stone tools is is really the question. And oh, but over time, uh, the quality of your tools, if you chip away at them and make them sharp and make them good for you, the quality of your tools can actually translate into a competitive advantage. Yeah, that's the first thing I, I kind of I, I think. The second thing is you know, and this is kind of back to my no regrets comment earlier. You know, I feel like. Uh, bias for action is is a really important leadership principle. Um, everywhere I looked at the company when I started, I saw builders, um, and 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 we weren't just this was not just a job. These were people who were making things, and I I I fit right into that. Um, in fact, do you remember Kim R's story about uh, about the Just Do It Award? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I'm trying to be humble here, but I won that award three times. So what did you? I'm, uh, I'm like Mr. Biased for action right here. I have one. Oh, it's up on top of my shelf up here. I don't. I actually have no idea what I got it for. That which is uh, that's kind of why I'm doing this podcast because I can't remember things as well anymore. <laughs> so, what's your uh, what's your favorite Just Do It award? Uh, since you got three of them, which which of the three is is probably your favorite? Oh, well, you know, Kim made a pretty good point that some of them were not for things that had a longstanding impact, and so you right. got to kind of put put that in perspective. But. Uh, but, you know, my point is definitely that, like, bias for action matters. And I, I like being biased for action. I don't think in innovation is necessarily highfalutin. I think it's right. moving fast and launching and iterating. Um, and so, you know, maybe I was a little bit of a loose cannon on the site, uh, on the team. But I think it's important to have some of those loose cannons. But let me see. Um, yeah, for, for the listener, while you look for that, I'll just share, like, the, just do it a word given out to employees who basically, and I added, I, I'll, I'll add a definition to the website, but basically it's to go do something. You're not allowed to ask for permission, which is part of it. Um, it has to be well thought out, but it doesn't even have to have been successful, which is a, you know, that's a Jeff way of thinking. Like hopefully it's successful, but that's, it's really that you're, because if you go and ask permission, not only is somebody going to be likely to say no, or um, but it's going to slow the process down. So they want people like Alex, who has an idea to do something, to to feel empowered to try it if he's given it good thought and thinks it's worth it. And so, and then some of those get recognized with these awards in front of the the whole company. That's right. That's a, that's a great way of describing it, Dave. Um, so yeah, okay. So I found one. Um, so just a quick context. Number one is after I'd done work on music and all these other product launches, I also worked on auctions, which Joel mentioned. You know, by that time I had achieved uh, a competence in uh, in rapidly dressing up the website with different types of UI and pulling different types of products together. Um, and anyone who knows me knows I love movies. So, um, so I'll never forget the all hands where, uh, where I got this award. This is, this is the, uh, the mid 90, mid 99 now. So it's, it, it's later. And by that time, the all hands, each, each quarter, the all hands would grow in size yeah. by, you know, a noticeable amount. So by this time, it's a pretty big audience of people. Jeff's up there on the, on the stage. Um, and, uh, and, and, and here's what he reads. Okay. Uh, my, my boss, Gus Lopez wrote, uh, did this write up when he nominated me. Uh, did your nominee undertake the effort of their own initiative? Yes. Did the nominee clear this effort ahead of time? No. <laughs> uh, and then Jeff, Jeff reads, pictured this is Jeff. Alex Danger Edelman created and launched the groovy Amazon.com Austin Power store the day that the spy who shagged me hit the theaters. From hipster books to shagadelic videos, Amazon.com customers were able to buy and sell Austin Powers products when they needed them most, all in one location. The store also featured links to Austin Powers at auctions, future video signups, IMDb information, and other Mike Myers movie titles. You would never guess that a child of the 70s, that's me, would have the right mojo to create this groovy store. Oh, behave. And then, of course, he laughs. <laughs> and it just rings out in the crowd. And so it was, that was a good one. I would say that's that was awesome. that was a good Just, just Do It award. If you have any screenshots of the Austin Powers store, I'd love to uh, include those as well. Um, I'll try to look. And, and, and one last part about the aspiring entrepreneurs thing. Like, how do you think that applies to new technologies? Like things nowadays, like uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, is it the same thing or are their tools a lot better comparatively? Or are they basically in the same, probably, uh, same type of place you were when you started working at Amazon on HTML? Interface programming has obviously come a long way since the first days of the web. Uh, and, the, you know, the web browser was a killer app because it was so lightweight. You only needed yeah. one piece of software to access this the internet of myriad user interfaces. Um, and because of the way HTML works and stuff, we, were, we maintained a high degree of control over the user experience because we shipped it out along with the transactions. So it was more like data. Right. Uh, and I believe that our ability to rapidly iterate and uh, in this area was a, was a key driver of our early growth. And so when I look at things like young technologies today, like VR, AR, voice command, they remind me a lot of the early web. They have a lot of promise, but very few people are taking them seriously yet. Uh, the bandwidth, hardware, and the access are all very limited. 
Um, but the UI is data that you can send along with other things. Right. And But basically, the tools are still made out of stone, and there are numerous constraints. But, you know, I've always felt that the best innovations are born out of extreme constraints. I would encourage entrepreneurs to, to lean into those young technologies, to lean into the stone tools and try to make something great and not be, not be afraid of the constraints. Um, and uh, I also think it's, it's vitally important to be biased for action uh, yeah. and willing to iterate rapidly, you know, even if you make mistakes, uh, especially on the part that interfaces with the customer, because they will tell you if it works or if it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for being a guest uh, on the podcast. I think people are going to really enjoy hearing, you know, what it was like making website HTML work in the early days uh, and also how far ownership and bias for action uh, can take a young employee. So it's sort of important for those young employees joining companies like Amazon, you know, that you have the ability to make a huge impact if you put your head down and uh, approach it with the right attitude. Um, and finally, it was great to see you. Uh, and catch up, uh, and uh, you know, and I meant what I said at the beginning of the podcast. Like, I really do remember you as one of like nicest, fr just a friendly person. Because I, I think it was probably from the auctions launch. You know, there were a lot of very stressful days, and we would have meetings. And there were certain people when you go in there, they don't lighten the mood. <laughs> you know, you're, you know, and and uh, you were just somebody, even though we were all stressed out and working hard that had time to smile. And, and uh, I feel the same way about your wife, uh, Jordan, as well. So uh, Jordan Hay is uh, also, that's the woman who almost uh, drowned you in, in Lake Union. Uh, that's right. The woman who hit me with the kayak is now my wife. So we're yeah. good now. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So it's nice to see uh, none of that niceness uh, has, has gone away or changed. So oh, thanks, Dave. You're too kind. It's great awesome. to see you too. I'm really excited you're doing this, the, the, this show. Oh, thanks. Well, for the audience, thank you for listening to the Invent Like an Owner podcast. Uh, if you'd like more details about what we discussed today uh, or want to contact me with edits or to correct what uh, the stories Alex just told, uh, it's his fault, not mine. Um, please visit inventlikeanowner.com to sign up for the weekly newsletter. Uh, that's it for today. And remember, no sniveling. <laughs>